Hello again, everybody, and welcome to Appointed to Promote Television, where, as always, we are appointed to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we do so in a news-like format designed to expose the lies, deceit, and corruption of the world with the truth, justice, and righteousness that only God's Word can provide. And as always, I'm your host, Ed Walsh, happy to be here for what today is going to be our 50th, yes, that's right, our 50th episode of ETP. We are halfway to 100, and I want to thank the good Lord above for giving me this journey to present to you these programs over the last 27 months. And so I figured today there'd be no more intriguing topic. It will also be our 12th episode in our Bible prophecy series today titled, The Antichrist. Who is he? And what is his role in the end times? And to kick things off, let's start with a quote from a man by the name of David Spangler, who eerily hit it on the head when he said the following, We do not want another committee. We have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all the people and to lift us up from the economic morass into which we are seeking. Send us such a man, and whether he be God or devil, we will receive him. Ominous, isn't it? Two of which I can only answer, be careful for what you wish for because it is a devil that you're going to get. And this is why I used the previous 11 episodes to help us build this end times puzzle that will point us directly to the Antichrist and in letting us know why he will be asked for, received, and eventually worshipped. So we've got much ground to cover and plenty of lists to share with you today. So let's get to answering our first question of the day, which is, who is the Antichrist? Well, the term Antichrist is defined this way. One who denies, opposes, or is in place of, or a substitute of Christ specifically. For he is referred to in the scriptures as the Antichrist five different times. It is also referred to under several other names, those being the beast, the desolator, the little horn, the man of sin, and the son of perdition, just to name a few. And it is the Antichrist who's spoken of throughout the Old and the New Testament, with over 64 verses referencing him, including 13 specifically from the book of Revelation which makes him one of the most spoken about characters in the Bible itself. Therefore, it's safe to say the Bible itself sees him as a most important and ominous character who will come upon the scene. And for a bit of insight into that, let's take a look at this clip with some words from the venerable Dr. David Jeremiah. 25 different titles That's for right. Antichrist That's in right. Revelation. 25? 25, he's called the man of sin, the lawless one, you can just go right through and and um, all of these titles are meant to give us a little glimpse into his character, his personality. He is the most wicked, most awful person. I mean, take Hitler and Stalin and uh, Mao Zedong and all those yeah. people, wrap them all up to one and then multiply them and you won't even come close to the awful uh, character of this man. And he's going to gain control of this world and everyone will be under his domination because if they aren't, they won't be able to function. The Bible says that early in his, in his uh, career, he takes power over three nations, and then with those three nations, he gets power over the European coalition, mm -hmm. and then ultimately he comes to power over all the world. Here's the key thing that he does. He makes a covenant with Israel at the beginning of his career, and he promises to protect them from all of their Arabic enemies. And, yeah. and the Bible says while they're at peace, he comes in and he breaks the covenant that he had made with them. So the peace treaty is is is, is negated. At it's the end over. of three and a half years, he comes in and he violates their temple. He comes in and he destroys. He's, see, when he makes the covenant, he says, you can continue your worship. At the end of the three and a half years, he says, that's it, no more. I'm going to be worshiped now. You you don't worship anymore. So we embody the most cruel of, of, of uh, leaders empowered by Satan. Satan. 
yeah. who has now assumed control of the world. Thank you, Dr. Jeremiah. And we will build upon that further from what Jesus said himself in his Olivet Discourse, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and will deceive many. And folks, the ultimate deceiver is the Antichrist. For just as it also says about him in 1 John, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. And when I think of this scripture, it reminds me of a lot of Antichrist candidates we've had throughout history. And I believe the reason for this is because Satan himself does not know the day or time of the end, therefore he knows he must have an Antichrist candidate waiting in the wings for when that day comes. So let's take a look at some examples of past Antichrists throughout history. Tryon for size, Alexander the Great, Nero, Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, Queen Mary, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Benito Mussolini, of course, Adolf Hitler, and for my money, the papacy as a whole. And as for Antichrist characters who are speculated upon today, here are just a few. Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, French President Emmanuel Macron, Russian President Vladimir Putin, Bill Gates, George Soros, Klaus Schwab, and of course, last but not least, the entire cast of The View. <laughs> but let me go on record in saying I don't believe any of those are the Antichrist himself. Sorry, Whoopi. Now, some of you may ask me, why are we discussing the Antichrist when we're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ? And I do totally agree with us looking for Jesus. And personally, I don't even believe we as the church will lay eyes upon the Antichrist. But there are four key reasons why I believe we must discuss a person so often mentioned in God's very own scriptures. Those being to cover the entire counsel of God. For the Bible tells us about those teachers, even being small ones like me, what we will have to face when we stand before God on Judgment Day. For it is in the book of James. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And that is why, folks, as long as you watch this channel and the ministry God has given me, I will cover this and all of the topics of God's Word without apology. Number two. Our loved ones who don't know Christ may have to face him. So knowing that we all surely will have loved ones who will be left behind and have to face the unfortunate situation of dealing with the Antichrist, isn't it imperative that we as believers share with them all of the evil characteristic traits and plans from this man so they can deny worshiping him and instead accept and worship the true and living Christ? Number three, without understanding about Antichrist, our understanding of eschatology will be completely inaccurate and incomplete. And I don't think on this topic there's nothing more that needs to be said. Therefore, moving on to number four, our ability to be a witness will be hampered. For we, as end times believers, should be able to ascertain the times and the seasons and therefore share the gospel accordingly. In other words, we shouldn't shrug these things off, nor should we simply say, well, it's all going to pan out. For God put us here on this earth at this time for much more than that, and we dishonor him with that kind of behavior, where we will now cover the six characteristics of the Antichrist. And starting with number one, he will be a man. For the Antichrist is consistently referred to as a male character for the original language and elsewhere in the Bible emphasizes 
a male leader in discussing the Antichrist, such as, as is described in 1 John. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. Number two, he will be a citizen of a Western nation. Now, to explain this in detail, you would probably need a whole nother program. But the Bible indicates that the Antichrist will come out of the revived Roman Empire. And check out the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 16 through 24, for more on this subject. Number three, he will be a powerful political leader. For it is in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, which tells us that the Antichrist will be a person who leads a nation of ten horns and seven heads. These horns are nations, and the heads are referred to as the nation's leaders who will be under the Antichrist's authority. Number four, he will be a spiritual leader. For although the Antichrist will oppose the God of the Bible, he will offer a false unity of religion and later will force people to worship him during the second half of the tribulation period. Number five, the Antichrist is a murderer, for he will slay countless people from Christians to Jews or to anyone who gets in his way. And this will even include the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 11. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And number six, the Antichrist is a deceiver. For whether it be breaking covenant treaties, changing times and laws, or claiming that I am he, he will speak like the lion of the tribe of Judah and appear like him. And how do we know this? Well, it comes from the book of Revelation when it discusses the first of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. And lastly, one other thing also comes to mind and that is that he will be part of an unholy trinity. For Satan himself is one of the greatest all-time copycats of God, for he has no creative ideas of his own. Therefore, just as there is the holy trinity, that being God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so there will be an unholy trinity comprised of Satan, also referred to as the dragon, the Antichrist, or Son of Satan, to which Satan will give him his power, and also to that of the false prophet, before then causing the people to worship the Antichrist himself. So now that we know who he is, the next question to answer is, what is his role in the end times? Well, there are countless passages in the Bible that help for us to establish what the Antichrist will accomplish, establish, and achieve during his rule. That being for 42 months during the Great Tribulation, of which come the following. And we'll start with the big one. He will claim to be God, desecrate the temple, and demand to be worshipped as God. For the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel, only to break it halfway through with the Jewish people, when doing so by what Jesus himself called the abomination of desolation, and of which the Apostle Paul expands upon in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Which ties in with number two, which is... He will blaspheme God and rule for 42 months. For it was given to him in mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. 
and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blast him, his name, and his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And number three, he will display miraculous and seductive powers of which you can read for yourself in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Number four, he will be killed and will come back to life, which it tells us in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, of which he will mimic the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's move to number five. He will rule the one world government of the tribulation, for which it tells us in Revelation 13, verse 7. Power was given to him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And number six, he will control the world's economy and establish the mark of the beast. And this will be a mark that pledges allegiance to the Antichrist, which tells us, and he causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, and the free man and the slaves, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead, and that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name, and causes all who receive it to worship him. And for more on that, here's a quick clip with Dr. Mark Hitchcock. Well, the Bible tells us in, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18 about this mark of the beast. It's the only time that the Bible really refers to it. And the word mark there in, in, the, in the Greek language means it like a tattoo, really, or an, or an etching or something that's scratched into something. So it says it's going to be upon the right hand or the forehead. And it says you can't buy or sell if you don't have the mark of the beast. Now, people wonder all about this as some kind of chip that's under the computer skin chip. or computer chip or barcode. There's been all, all kinds of speculation. In fact, we were talking earlier about a friend of ours, Dr. Harold Wilmington. Yeah. He used to always say there's been a lot of sick, sick, sick about 666. <laughs> and I always like that because the mark of the beast is 666 there in, in the book of Revelation. Is this and during the time of Antichrist when Antichrist is yes. at, it's at his prominent place uh, in the world of leadership and and basically the execution of how economy is done will be through this mark? That's right. It's going to be that last three and a half years, I take it, of this coming time of seven years of tribulation on the earth when he's going to rule the world. So not only will there be a one world government, but there will be a one world economy. And we can see how that can happen today. Very, and so very with good. Dr. Hitchcock's expansion on the mark of the beast, number seven, he will confirm a short-lived covenant with Israel of which he breaks in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Number eight will be to destroy Israel and God's chosen people, the Jews, of which we will see two-thirds of the Jewish people slaughtered by the Antichrist and his armies during the Battle of Armageddon. For in chapter 13, verse 4, and they worship the dragon which gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast. Now, to be honest with you, I have two more key roles that the Antichrist will fulfill, but for those, I will wait until the end of the program. And as for the items the Bible doesn't tell us about the Antichrist, those would be the following. It does not tell us his ethnicity, his age, or his specific birthplace. But it does say in the book of Daniel, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard for any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now this here has some people thinking that the Antichrist may be a homosexual, although I will look to put that to rest. For we are going to look at four biblical scriptures that I believe helps point us to the identity of the Antichrist himself. Now, before you jump out of your chairs, let me emphasize that I'm looking to end human speculation by pointing to the scriptures themselves to guide us so that we can decipher its own symbols. Well, the four key passages of scripture that tells us who the Antichrist may be begins with number one. He will claim the ability to forgive sins. And to begin to break this down, let's take a look at the book of Revelation, chapter 13. 
And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now, let me focus on the blasphemy portion of this passage, as we will now use the Bible to define blasphemy for itself. For in John chapter 10, it tells us, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So blasphemy is defined as anyone who makes himself out to be God. And as we've already covered in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Antichrist will sit in the temple showing himself that he is God. And to back that up further, let's look at another definition of blasphemy in the Bible from the book of Mark. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So the Bible tells us in this verse that blasphemy, is defined as the ability to forgive sin. So when the Bible tells us that the beast has a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, we may know that he will claim to be God and claim the prerogatives of God, such as the ability to forgive sin. And so let me ask you, is there any one individual or entity out in the world today who claims to have the ability for the forgiveness of sins? Number two, the Antichrist will reside on seven mountains. For the Bible gives us the location and the seat of the Antichrist. For again in Revelation chapter 13 it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. So we are told that the beast will have seven heads. Now, using the Bible to define its own symbols, we look to the book of Revelation chapter 17, which tells us exactly what those seven heads represent. And here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So simply put, the Bible tells us that the symbol of these seven heads are to be understood as to referencing to seven mountains, showing us that the Antichrist power will sit or reside in an area of seven mountains or seven hills. So is there a place in the world today which sits on seven hills? Well, the seven hills of Rome are a collection of hills upon which the ancient city of Rome was constructed. This was where the original Roman palace stood and where today Vatican City, the seat of the worldwide Catholic administration, the Holy See, is nestled on the west bank of the Tiber River in Rome, Italy. And moving to number three, the Antichrist thinks to change times and laws. And this, folks, is told to us in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, when it says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. And speaking of laws, what did Jesus Christ himself say about the commandments? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, for I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in the book of Psalm, chapter 89, verse 34, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. And what is the covenant that God promised not to alter? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13, it says, And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even ten commandments, and wrote them upon two tablets of stone. So the covenant here is the ten commandments. And yes, it was the Catholic Church who changed the laws of God. How? 
Well, they now have their own Ten Commandments. For the Roman Catholic Church took away the second commandment, you shall not make idols, which is no surprise given the fact that they make the saints and Jesus' mother Mary idols of worship. They also changed the fourth commandment from remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy to remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. And if that's not enough, they even divided the tenth commandment into two from you shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor house too. And they changed that to you shall not covet your neighbor's wife as the ninth commandment and you shall not covet your neighbor's goods as the tenth commandment. And it is the papacy folks who of course believes they have the power to change the laws of God as his representatives upon the earth. Are you getting the picture here? And here's the last, but also a quick and easy one. He will be arrayed in purple and scarlet. For in chapter 17, we have a vision of the harlot riding on the beast from chapter 13. And it is in this verse that we are simply told, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. So let me ask you, from what you've already seen, from the previous scriptures obviously appointing to an apostate church, do you know of any church or entity that adorns itself in purple and scarlet colors? So with that said, my fellow viewers, the only entity that can check all of these boxes would be the Catholic Church and the Papacy. And if you'd like to debate it, do me a favor and leave comments in the comment section of the program. So the Antichrist, regardless of identity, will make a covenant with the Jewish people which he will break when declaring himself God in the Jewish temple. This will catapult us into the final three and a half years referred to as the Great Tribulation in which the Antichrist will wear down the saints, pour an all-out assault on the Jewish people, control government, religion, armies, and kings. Now, we can't end our episode tonight until we cover the final two items about the Antichrist I promised to earlier. And that will be that he will lead his army against Jesus Christ at the Battle of Armageddon, as read in Revelation chapter 16, verses 12 through 16. But his fate will be sealed by the wrath and the vengeance of Jesus Christ himself when number two unfolds. Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet will spend eternity in the lake of fire. For in Revelation chapter 19, And the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And as for Satan, try chapter 20 verse 10. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So yes, our study today has been centered around uncovering the person, the role, and the atrocities of Antichrist. But at the end of the story, it's the one true Christ, Jesus Christ, who wins the day. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you too will win the day. Therefore, the question becomes, do you know Jesus? For the choice is ultimately simple. It's either Jesus Christ or the Antichrist. It's either eternal life or eternal destruction. By choosing either the false king 
or the King of Kings. For if you weren't with us for our 49th episode on Catholicism, let me emphasize to you, my friends, that you cannot earn your eternal salvation. For it is Jesus Christ who has earned your salvation and earned it alone by paying the ultimate price upon the cross of which you only need to receive to reap the benefits of eternal life through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Follow the five steps before you with a sincere and repentant heart, and Christ will forgive all past, present, and future sins, and will officially punch your ticket towards a new life, in which you will begin to run the race toward heaven and where Christ will set his own footprints before you to follow. So please do not delay and receive Jesus Christ today. So I hope tonight's program has given you more of an understanding of who the Antichrist is and what he will look to accomplish when he is here. So with that said, that's going to bring us to the end of tonight's episode, but not before, as always, we give you a preview of what now will be our 51st episode of ATP, of which we will cover a most interesting topic. What are the Jewish feasts? And what role do they play in God's prophetic plan? So I can assure you folks, this is a most exciting episode you will not want to miss next week. So with that said, as always, hey, do me a favor, give me a thumbs up on the channel down below to let me know you like the episode. As well, leave any and all comments as well as any future episode topics you'd like me to cover. And lastly, as always, Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification so that you can stay up to date with all of the latest episodes of Appointed to Promote TV. So with that, again, I want to thank you for 50 amazing episodes and your support and prayers, and we'll continue to ask for them in the next 50 episodes, God willing. So lastly, we will end as we always do with our signature Bible verse of the channel from the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, which simply says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So until I see you next time, my friends, God bless.